Hello, everyone. I'm Saurabh Madan, and welcome to another of our special value investing talks. We have a very, very special guest today with us. He is uh, you know, an investor par excellence. Uh, he searches for long-term compounders. But just speaking with him before you know, this talk began, I can also tell you that he has a great sense of humor. So uh, I hope uh, we get uh, to see that in action live as he asks you questions and you ask him questions. So I'm going to do a very, very brief introduction. Ch Charles T. Acre, also known as Chuck Acre, is an American investor, financier, and businessman. He serves on the board of directors of the NSTAR Group. He's also the founder, chairman, and CIO of Acre Capital Management, FBR Focus, and other funds. Acre Capital Management uh, uh, is based in Middleburg, Virginia. So without any further ado, over to Chuck Acre. Thank you, Sarab. Great. So I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, I've not been associated with the FBR Focus Fund since the August of 2009. And uh, that was a fund that I ran previously and uh, before we started our own fund in September of 2009. Um, I, I just wrote down some notes, and uh, the, the headline in the notes said the peregrinations of an English major in search of the investment puzzle. And, um, and uh, Saurabh said that he was interested, and the group would be interested in sort of the, the whole way I got involved in this and how it's evolved. And I started out as what I call a know-nothing. I was a, a pre-med student and then an English major, and so I, I had not had a single business course of any variety. When I started in a, as a stockbroker in July of 1968, so your quick math can tell you how long I've been at this, <laughs> uh, a while. In Virginia, they say, since dirt. Um, and, um, and so I had, it, in effect, really a clean canvas as to as to where I should go and what I should do, and so I was since I knew nothing, my goal was to was to figure this out. And the investment puzzle was started out with, you know, what makes a good investor and what makes a good investment. And I read voraciously and still do. Uh, and in in the early works that I read that were were very important to me were books like John Train's The Money Masters. It had, it was the first, it was the first written story about Warren Buffett other than a Forbes magazine article and that sort of stuff. And, and in the, actually in that, uh, Buffett outlines the only place that I've ever seen it, he, he, gives, uh, he gives the characteristics of a great business and the characteristics of what makes a great investor. Uh, and, and that was a very important book to me. I read things like The Intelligent Investor, Ben Graham wrote. Um, in 1972, I came across a book that was re reviewed in, um, in Barron's called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. And it was written by a, a Boston investment manager. His name was Thomas Phelps. Phelps. And, and what was interesting to me was that it, it, it really made me come around and focus on the idea of compound return. He never actually explicitly talks about compound return, but he identified roughly 350 businesses, public companies, that you could have invested in beginning in the mid-30s all the way up to 71 and made 100 times your money. And in fact, there were a couple instances where you'd have made 100 times your money in just two or three years, a really quite extraordinary thing. The difference in all of those, of course, has to do with the rate at which you compound your capital. And so that, that helped me down, down that line. And I also read, then, and still do lots of business biography because it, it informs me about human behavior, how people behave in their business life and business world and how that affects what they're able to do. So as I said at the beginning, the puzzle was, what makes a great investor? And, and how do you how do you uh, how do you identify this? How do you how do you identify um, um, a great investment? If, for example, you have a private company, you can't just say, "Well, the price of the stock went up." You know, if it's private, there's no public share price disclosure. 
So, you know, the simple way to describe it is if the pile of money at the end of the year is bigger than at the beginning of the year, you know, you know it's, it's been successful. But if you had a business that was, had so much opportunity to grow that you invested all the free cash, and so you didn't have a pile of money at the end of the year, you invested it in initiatives to grow, you know, you have to go to your accountant or your bookkeeper, or what are your CFO or whatever, and he says, well, this is what your value was at the end of last year, and this is what your value is at the end of this year, and, and that's how you know if a business is successful, and it's a really important idea because it just brings you back to the simple issue of rate of return, and so not only how much has it gone up, but on an annualized basis, what, and, then, and then you have things you can com compare it to. Um, so. In that issue about, about investors, what makes a great investor, and one of the things you know you ask yourself, do you take undue risks? How do you define the risks? Uh, how do you tell? Have you lost a significant amount of money in an investment? Why do you think you've done that? All of these are important as we develop our, our skill as investors. And, and as I said, you know, I had, I had the, the advantage of a clean canvas. That is, I knew nothing when I came into the business. And, and, and I worked for a firm that when I joined it in, in July of 1968 was the most important financial intermediary in Washington, D.C. It had financed Geico, it had financed Marriott, it had financed all the other companies that were public in the Washington area. And the world was changing rapidly as it related to the investment business and the brokerage business in the late 60s and early 70s. And this firm wasn't particularly well suited to deal with that but they were financially very strong, and it gave me an opportunity, to, as I say, to follow my own nose in that business, and, and that's how it comes about. So when we get to the piece about well, what, what makes a great investment, we, I go back to this issue of rate of return. You know, sometimes a great investment might be simply described as, well, it, it met my goal. That, that doesn't tell you anything. Rate of return, we say in our firm, is the bottom line of all investing. Uh, and, and that's a really important thing to, to, to think about. And, and so, uh, so Rob and I were talking um, uh, before this, this chat today about, uh, about uh, businesses that compounded 8 or 9%. And I said, you know, 8 or 9%, when you compare it to 1.5% interest rate on the 10-year, is pretty attractive. And everything's relative. Um, so, but but I think rate of return is is hugely important, and and so then I went to discover what the historical rates of return were in all different asset categories: stocks, bonds, art, real estate, oil and gas, collectibles, fancy cars, you name it. And over, in and when I was looking at this over maybe seventy years now, over a hundred years or something like that. Um, the data indicates that um, public companies in the United States have compounded at roughly between 9 and 10% a year. And that's better than all other asset categories, and it's unleveraged. And, and um, so that causes me to ask another question. And that other question is, well, why is that so? Why isn't it 3% or why isn't it 16%? And um, I'm not, I'm not uh, terribly mathematically inclined, and, and so I, I use the term that it correlates, but I, d I don't do that with a mathematical background. I'm just saying I, I observe that that 9 10%, not too precise, is, uh, is approximates what these companies are earning on the shareholder's capital. That is, uh, we, we refer to it simply as ROE. We look a little bit more in depth, we, we're talking about free cash flow return, um, you know, subtracting maintenance capex and that sort of stuff on the owner's capital, capital employed. And, and so, so I, I go from there to, to, to posit the following. Um, our return in an asset will approximate the ROE over a period of years given constant valuation and given the absence of any distributions. So you all look up at me and you say, well, you fool. Everybody knows you don't have a constant valuation in the stock market. So we just work very hard to have a, an attractive valuation at the start. And you know as it relates to compounding your capital, your opportunity for a higher rate of compounding 
is enhanced by a lower valuation at the start. I mean, it's just real simple. Um, and I have a little bit of, a, of a, an arithmetic proof of that, if you're interested. Um, you take a $10 stock with a $5 book and a dollar's worth of earnings, so it's, it's 10 times earnings, it's two times book, and it's a 20% ROE. And you, and you, you apply that to, 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 to the company and see what happens to the stock price. So you add that dollar's worth, of that 20% ROE, you add that dollar, dollar to the five, you have a $6 book. Two times book is 12. Um, you, you have a uh, 10 times uh, earnings. You, by the way, it's a dollar it's 20 in earnings now. 10 times earnings is 12. So the stock price moves identically with the ROE in the business. And, and, and on a constant valuation, absent any distributions, that's sort of my very modest level of a proof of this notion. And it's a valuable notion that served us well for a long period of time. So then my next question is, well, how is it that we identify um, an investment which will likely lead us to an above average rate of return? What, what are the characteristics and, and, um, and, and what, what kinds of businesses earn above average rates of return? So we, we, we say very, very carefully that, that we like to fish in the pond of high return businesses. And so it makes it much easier for us to get our focus up front is we start with the notion of what kind of returns on capital does that business earn? And I'm just do something a little bit interactive here today. I, if, if I ask Sarab, what, uh, what, what is the, the typical net margin of an American business today in percentage terms, what would you say? 10 to 15. So you think it's 10, maybe a little bit above that. I, I would say, I'd suggest that most people answer that it's probably in mid or upper, upper single digits, all right? And, and an investment that we own, I'll come back around to later on, is MasterCard and Visa. And, and does anybody want to guess what the net margins of MasterCard and Visa are? There you go. So they're in the mid-30s. You know, and you could, you could cut that in half twice, and at worst it would be an average business. It's extraordinary. So it caught, and I, I actually was talking to some people about this at, at the Munger meeting the other day, people who are well-schooled in the market and, and good investors, and they had no idea. They, they, they just didn't think of it that way. And, and, but that happens to be the way we think about it because, because we have this little, little idea that, our, that our, our returns will be affected by the quality of the business and the rate at which it can grow the economic value per share. So, uh, and so by the way, in, in MasterCard, and I, I can come back to it, but it also then causes us to, to spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, why is that so? What, what is it about the essence of that business that allows them to earn returns that, that cause them to have a big bullseye on their back, that everybody, all other companies want a piece of a, of a business that has returns that are that high? Um, so, so in my office for, some really unknown reason, I had on the desk an old-fashioned milking stool. And it had come to me through my father, and it had come to him through uh, a, a business partner of his. And uh, on the top of this platform, it, it, it stands about that high, and it has three legs. And the, the first two are in the front, and the third one is in the middle and the back, and they're splayed. And a, and a farmer who was milking his cow would grab that back leg and sort of just stick it up under his behind as he sat down to milk a cow. This was in the old days when they did it by hand. And so I was looking at that one day, and I thought, well, you know, that's actually a perfect construct for our notion about what makes a valuable investment. We call it the three-legged stool. So if you looked at our material, our material is resplendent with these three-legged stools. And, and the first leg of that, and we just use this as a shorthand version, a construct to help us think in very simple terms about how you find these great investments. So the first leg is this issue of a high return business, an exceptional business. MasterCard is an exceptional business. The average business earns, call it 8% after tax on earnings, and MasterCard earns 34%. That's exceptional. That's, that, I mean, even, even if the average were 10, 10% would be exceptional. But, but I mean, MasterCard's 34%, my God, it's really incredible. So the first leg of the stool that we talk about is this, 
is the quality of the business enterprise. And we spend a lot of time going down this road that we call, what's the essence of this business? What is it about the business that's, that's causing this unbelievable rates of return to occur? The second leg of the stool then goes into the operations. It has to do with the people who run the business. And, and uh, um, the shorthand version of that is we want them to have both skill and integrity. But what we say is that they've got a demonstrated record of being just killers at operating their business. But in addition to that, they treat us as partners even though they don't know us. And it's a really important idea because uh, the, the, the reverse of that is, is somebody I heard described the other day is talking like Warren Buffett and acting like Ronald Perlman. And, and, and there, 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 there are people out there, and you'll find them, you'll run across them, who do whatever they can to make sure that the public shareholders don't get their fair share. And we don't want that. We want the same thing happens at the company level to happen at the per share level. And, and that these are wonderfully skilled operators as well. So first leg is the quality of the business. The second leg is really the quality of the people who run the business. And then the third leg is, is the issue that really helps create the value, and that's the reinvestment. And there are, there's, a, there's a book out pretty current now called Mr. Dear Mr. Chairman, or Dear Chairman. And it's, it's about activists and companies and trying to change the behavior of companies because of their, typically because of their reinvestment histories. And, and if, a, if a business has a great high return on the owner's capital, um, we would love for them to be able to take all the free cash they generate and put it back into that business to continue to earn those high rates of return. Um, it's way more efficient than paying us a dividend, uh, it, it, all of those things, and that's what creates the compounding effect. And, and <clears throat> you know, when I get around to, to compounding, um, you, you know, I always uh, use the example, you all have seen it on the web, about the penny. And, uh, and so I'm going to ask this engineer right here, would you rather have in this hand $750,000 or a penny doubled every day for 30 days? So you want the penny, right? And I knew that. So instead of $750,000, I'm going to make it $2 million in my right hand versus the penny, double every day for 30 days. You want, still want the penny. So I figured that. How about $2 million one? Well, I mean, it was, you know, this choice, it was $2 million before. You still took the penny. I'm saying, how about if I make it $2 million one? That's a lot of money. I'd take the $2 million. Yeah, see? Now, who knows right off the top of the head what that figure is? 10.8 million. Yeah, it's 10.8 million. It's 10,737,000 or something like that, and some change. And, and so the, the simple arithmetic is it's 100% return for 30 periods. You know? And that's the power of compounding. And so the, the, the really great thing about compounding, I tell people, is you know, if you have a stock that's going up 10 times, the next time it doubles, it's going up 20. And the, you know, the next time it doubles, it's going up 40 times. What? You know, compounding, compound interest and compound return is just, it's, it's staggering. Most, actually, I have a correspondence with Warren Buffett about this. And he always has said, as it relates to compounding, either you get it or you don't. And I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, that was not my experience. My experience was I didn't get it until I experienced it. And, and, that, and that goes to this whole issue of investing. I have never been able to learn from other people's mistakes. You know, I have to make my own. Uh, and so this process, this process uh, is, is, is designed to help me and my colleagues and partners um, have focus as it relates to how we're going to invest. Contrary to that is everything you see on the TV in the morning on Squawk Box or all those things. And they have a different business model. And their business model is mostly supported by financial institutions and other inst consumer institutions who want your eyeballs. And if it's, a, if it's a brokerage firm that's sponsoring it, the definition of a broker is to create transactions, right? You're advertising people, they want to create transactions, right? And what's the best way to create a transaction in the brokerage industry? Create what I call false expectations. And the false expectations are the notion that 
that XYZ company earns $1.37 in the quarter. And the first thing that happens when they release their, their, their quarterly reports is everybody comes out and says, oh, they earned $1.38, they beat by a penny, you better buy it. Or they earned $1.36, they missed by a penny, you better buy it. Well, if you stop and think about it, unless you're very adept at trading the market on a daily basis, it, it's a sure loser for you. It, it's bad for your economic health. And as it relates to trading the market on a daily basis, you know, there are very powerful computer algorithms out there using all kinds of information not available to most of us that are competing against you. So I just, we just make that observation. We try very hard to be um, investors in the value of businesses as opposed to speculators in the price of shares. Um, so um, n now, do you remember what a penny doubled every day for 30 years? <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't lose sight of that. <laughs> so we, we tell our, our clients and our prospective clients that our goal is to compound their capital at an above average rate while incurring a below average level of risk. So let's start with the back end of that. What do we mean by a below average level of risk? Well, the businesses we own typically have the following characteristics. They have more growth. They have higher returns on capital. They have stronger balance sheets and frequently lower valuations than the market. So on their face, they're less risky. It's just, it's observable. It doesn't have anything to do with volatility because our belief is volatility is a risk only in the short run. If you have an obligation in a year to buy a house or to do something like that, you know, you probably don't want to speculate with the, that cash that you have set aside for that. But if it's five years or three years, you know, you have the ability to put that money at work and, and have it work for you. So volatility is not in our lexicon, basically, in terms of risk. And we've already talked about what average is, and we think average is roughly high single digits, maybe low double digits. And it has to do with what the overall interest rate environment is. And so there are lots of investors, Michael Steinhardt and people like that, who retired with records of very high rates of returns. But that was against the backdrop that in January of 1981, the long bond, the 30-year treasury, yielded 15 and 3 eighths percent. And prime rate was 21.5%. So it was in a backdrop in which rates were much higher than they are currently. So returns in all businesses are lower these days. And my guess is average these days would probably be at the low end of that sort of high single digits number. Um, and, and, and because it's an average we're talking about, it does not mean that we will have a return on any given year that's better than that. It means to us over a period of five years or 10 years, our returns are very likely to be well above that number. But, but I would say if observably, maybe a third of the years in the last 25, we maybe have done less well than the, than the S&P, which is, we, we use that simply because it's available. We don't care what indices people want to compare us to, that's their choice. We, we spend no time thinking about that. Um, and so, um, it's, it's, uh, I, I border on, on, uh, um, on salesmanship here a little bit, and I'll, you, you can edit this out, Sir Rob, if you want. But, but the record uh, that, that we have accomplished for our clients, I'll just tell you very, I'll give you some numbers very, very quickly. Our separately managed accounts, which, which, we, which we've been doing for 27 years, have compounded at 12.7% versus the S&P at that period of time of 9.4%. So a little over 300, you know, 330 basis points over the market compounded annually for 27 years. Uh, we have a private investment partnership that's been around for 23 years and it's compounded at, at 15 and a quarter percent net to the partners versus 9.2% for the S&P during that specific period of time. So 23 years, 600 basis points over the market. Uh, 
we've run two mutual funds in our life, the FBR Focus Fund and then subsequently the Ocri Focus Fund. Those two records combined, the, 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 the number is, 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 uh, is 13.2% versus 7 7.7%. Um, 550 over the S and P uh, over over the S and P for that period of time, 19 years, and then simply the fund that we currently manage, the Acri Focus Fund, which has been in existence a little over seven years, um, it's uh, it's 125 basis points over the market, and the market has been 13 and a half percent in that seven year period of time. So, so I I just say that, and I don't print them for you, but I just say that to say, this is the outcome of using this thought process in our investments. Um, Saurabh has asked that, that maybe we talk a, a, couple, a couple of minutes about some examples. And going way back into the 80s and early 90s, we invested in a company called International Speedway Corporation. And International Speedway had the characteristics of, of a, it was 12 times earnings, it was 25, 26% return on equity, uh, it had an owner operator who owned 60% of the stock, and it had a lot of growth in front of it because it was the dominant racetrack owner in NASCAR racing. And they owned International Speedway and Darlington and Talladega, and they went on to, to build some more. It, it's not a very attractive business in my mind today for a bunch of reasons. The man who ran it, Bill France, passed away. His daughter's taken it over. She, she, she doesn't have the same skill set that he had, and. And, 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 but, but during that period of time, we made 10 to 20 times our money on that business over more than 10 years. Um, another company that was also in the entertainment-related business was a company called Penn National Gaming. And, and um, the way these, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of um, serendipity about the way these things come out. Uh, a, a young man who was working for me at the time, talking to another investor, said to us, well, you ought to look at the 10Q of this company called Penn Gaming. And, and we did, and in Penn Gaming at the time, in Pennsylvania, Saurabh was in Philadelphia there, uh, in Pennsylvania had five off-track betting parlors in Pennsylvania. And they were limited by licenses in the state. There were only a total of 23 in the state. So you had a high barrier to entry because of a regulatory issue. And what was interesting in this, in this 10Q was, the fifth off-track betting location that they built cost them $2 million to build it out. And they had you know, $1.6 million of operating income in the first 12 or 14 months. I'm saying that's not a bad business, you know? Um, I took it upon myself to go meet the CEO. We talked about the importance of people. He was a real estate developer by background. His father had control of this old racetrack, Penn National Gaming, that had, because of Pennsylvania, they had given the licenses for the off-track betting to the legalized gambling arena, the, the racetrack, the horse racetrack business, and he was ambitious. And as a, as a builder and developer, he borrowed a lot of money in his lifetime, and he told me that he had been able to avoid ever having his wife sign, co-sign a loan. That's a really important measure of risk understanding. And, and so I, I got involved. And it was after that that he bought another racetrack in West Virginia, about an hour and a half from Washington in Baltimore, and converted that into a casino that now has 5,000 slot machines. And he went on to become the largest non-Las Vegas, non-Atlantic City casino operator in the country. And uh, it's another case where we made 10 to 20 times our money in, in our accounts. Again, uh, this, this was a situation of high returns on capital, low valuation, major shareholder, owner, and operator, um, and, and a low valuation with a huge opportunity for growth going forward. And, 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 and then in, in, in current times, we talked a little bit about, about MasterCard. Um, you know, some things that are, that are interesting about MasterCard we purchased it originally in February of 2010. And this is when the Dodd-Frank discussions were going on in Congress after the financial crisis, and more particularly about the Durbin Amendment, which had to do with domestic debit transactions. The long and short of it is we, we bought the stock at 
on an average price of 22.20 in 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 January February of 2010. Uh, today it's um, 109, something like that. Uh, so you know we've made five times our money in 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 six years, seven, you know something like that. And and the reason was that here's a business that had fantastic returns as we've already talked about. It had a low valuation. The valuation in in uh, February of 2010 was something like 13 or 14 times. It was growing its free cash flow per share at a rate much faster than that. And we had a good thing happen with it, that we've been to meet the new CEO, uh, Ajay Banga, who's a Punjabi, and, uh, and uh, a, you know, really bright, interesting, lovely guy. And, and so you, you and I were talking earlier about, about the interaction of people. And so we see him in a, in a setting with other executives in his firm, and he's first name basis, kidding with them, they kid with him. All of these things are important, just things, you know, I talked about reading business biography. You get a feel for how people behave and how they deal with their colleagues and so on. And, and so we've made five times our money in six short years in an extraordinary business. Now, if you remember what I talked about, the third leg, reinvestment, their returns are so high that they can't possibly find another place to reinvest their money at that rate and get that return. So we, our, our compounding is diminished modestly because of that. So they buy in scads of stock, they pay a dividend, they invest a lot in new technologies, all relating to what I call the electronic exchange of value. I mean, that's really the business they're in and we don't know what form factor it will take in, the, in, in years, but they're well positioned in all of the things that are going on today. Another, another company that, that is relatively new to us is, is Moody's. And we, we bought our Moody's originally in January of 2012. And we, we paid uh, um, about $39, a little less than $39 for it. Today, it's $110. Uh, and so we have a case where we've, we've made, uh, you know, two and a half, two and three quarters times our money. Uh, again, the same idea. A, a great business, you know, after, after Dodd-Frank, the, the government authorized another six or eight um, rating agencies to exist. I'm sure there's not a person in this room who can tell you the name of any of them. It's a market-driven thing. It's not regulatory-driven. Um, and so any company that issues debt has to go out and get a rating on it. And there are really three rating agencies, Moody's, S&P, and Fitch. The market is divided like 40%, 40%, and 20%. Fitch has had 20% for nearly 100 years. They just can't seem to grow it any larger than that, and it's market-driven. And if you sit on the board of a, of a company that's about to raise debt, and you go out, and you don't get a rating on your, on your, on your debt, and you have a, a, a bad effect in the market, you, know, you have a liability. So it's a really, it's a fascinating business that, that again, market forces allow it to have very high returns on its capital. Um, another company that, that, that we've been involved with for, um, gee, almost 10 years is a company called NSTAR. And I sat on their board for five years um, because I wanted to try to understand how the business really operated. And it's a complicated business. They buy insurance, which is in runoff, and that is, Operating insurance companies periodically decide, well, we don't want to be in homeowners anymore. We don't want to be in long haul trucking anymore, whatever. And they run that business off and they're required to keep assets to support those liabilities by the regulators until that business is, is gone. And, and executives in businesses like insurance who have uh, aspirations in their career would not like to be placed in the runoff. It's, it's sort of the back room of the business. And this group of, of people who started this company are, are um, chartered accountants by, by training. Uh, and they, they, they're headquartered in South Africa and Dublin and Bermuda and London. And they travel all over the world uh, all the time in search of trying to find these little pieces of business. I've seen instances where they worked on a piece of business for five or six years. They're very patient, very disciplined. And when I got involved in this company in 2007, uh, it had had a record of compounding book value per share a little bit north of 20%. But it was also three times book. And I paid uh, 
$2.90 for my first shares in 2007. And today it's worth about $195. So it's not been a very good investment. And you know, I mean, I've, I've essentially doubled my money, but, but it's taken 10 years. So that number obviously roughly around 7% compounded. Um, but then, then the valuation got more attractive periodically. And in, in uh, 2009, I was able to buy some stock at 56. So my return there is nearly four times. And that sort of stuff. And, and so that goes back to this issue I was talking about, your starting valuation. And, and you know, when I paid three times book for this company in 07, and it had a history of compounding book at 20%, had it been able to continue to compound at 20%, I would have done much better. But their rate of return has come down, just like it has in all businesses, as we've had this secular decline in interest rates for 36 years as a backdrop. Everybody's business returns are lower, nearly everybody. And so those are, those are sort of three examples, of, of five examples of, of businesses that we own or have owned where we've had these great returns uh, as a result of using this process, using our process of, we call it the three-legged stool of identifying businesses that we think are likely to give us a return that's above average. Um, I, I'm, I'm getting near the end here, you're getting um, anxious, I know that. So I'll give you a few quotes out of Einstein because I find him simply a great thinker. Uh, you should make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, you'll have to think about it a minute. The difference between stupidity and genius is that genius has its limits, you know? Uh, <laughs> we, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking the way we use to create them. Uh, the only source of knowledge is experience. Um, imagination is more important than knowledge. I told Surab that's what it actually says on the front of my book. Um, and the two, true test of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. So we put our own little quote on the end of that. It's, a, it's an old saw, which says that good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> um, so in conclusion, um, we work in a town with one traffic light. And I say it makes the decision process so much simpler. Einstein, make things as simple as possible. We tell people when they get to the light turn, sooner or later they'll get to us in town. Um, and what's really important is that in a campus like this or in Central Park South in New York or in downtown San Francisco or Los Angeles, we'd be surrounded by hundreds of people who were very bright and very interesting. And the reason we're in a town with one traffic light away from that is that their stuff would be intellectually appealing to us. And it would distract us from what it is we do well. And that's a really important notion. Warren talked about getting out of New York and going back to Omaha when he was a young man. It's the same idea, and, and not, that, not that being in your midst wouldn't be unbelievably fulfilling or being in New York or something like that. It's that it distracts us from what we do well. And so that's a really important thing as you're thinking about being an investor is to create the situation for yourself that you have the ability to apply what it is that you've learned and found valuable in investing as opposed to listening what Squawk Box or your next door neighbor or your sweet mate says, something like that. Um, um, make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. Imagination is more important than knowledge, you know? Um, so I would say simply use your own observations. It's very important. Peter Lynch used to talk about, about buying the things that you see happening. You, there's in the shopping center, there's a new store and they're getting a lot of traffic or whatever. And, and, and Peter had an unusual, do you all know who Peter Lynch is? He, he ran, he, I mean, he had a really unusual talent. He had 1,200 securities in the Fidelity Magellan Fund. He ran it for eight or nine years and had a phenomenal record and so on. But he had 1,200 securities. I mean, imagine, so I was in seeing him one day and what he would do, we were talking about this earlier, is if he found an industry that he liked or he would buy every company in that industry, 
put them in his portfolio and then he'd eliminate them one at a time as he kept honing in on who were the best ones and so on. Uh, it's, it's not a talent that I have. Um, and then I say, just because you have a big brain doesn't mean you could be good at investing. And that's an important thing too. And finally, there is no correct answer. There is no correct way. This is just the way that works for us. Um, I'm happy to have the opportunity to share these few thoughts with you. And I guess we'll have a few Q&A. Yes, thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Yep. If you can take a seat, uh, that would be fantastic. I just have a couple of quick questions for you. And thank you for showing us a glimpse of the sense of humor that I was talking to you guys about. Um, so just before the talk started, uh, you and I were talking about family. Yes. And uh, you were talking about your kids. And if I remember correctly, none of them are doing what you did Correct. in your career. And uh, I mean, over the years of successful investing, uh, you know, by the numbers that you shared with us, uh, I'm sure you've made a little bit of money for yourself. Uh, I'm not worried about my next meal, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, I was just curious, what are your thoughts? You, you said that it is, you believe it is important for, to let your kids have their own struggles in life. So talk yeah. to us a little bit about family, about raising kids, about giving money away, maybe. So um, my wife and I um, spend a reasonable amount of time figuring out how we can put the money to use in, in places that, that um, are, will be advantaged by it as it relates to the things that we're interested in are land conservation, um, healthcare issues, uh, education, shelter, uh, things of that nature, and, and so we, we pursue that significantly as, as so many people do. Um, and, it, and then it, it creates an issue, excuse me, within the family where we've developed um, an asset base that we certainly never expected to have, and, um, and we've seen, um, particularly where we live in, 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 in work in Middleburg, Virginia, you know, Paul Mellon lived there, and Jackie Mars lives there, and there's a lot of wealth in that area, and we've had a chance to see people who have been, uh, well, as we would say, they're on scholarship or they're on full scholarship. And, and we see some of those whose lives are really upended because of the fact that they have a vast amount of capital available to them. They don't have to work, they, and, and they don't. And, and so the phrase that, that my wife and I use is we don't want to deprive our children of the opportunity to struggle. Struggle in my own life has been very valuable. I was telling Daniel yesterday, there have been a number of times in my life that if, you, if your glasses had the right rose color in them, uh, my assets would, work, would equal my liabilities. But, it, but you had to have the right color rose glasses, you know. And, and so those experiences have been valuable to me as a, as a human being and as an investor and so on. And, and so that's one of the things that we think about and talk about and work out. Thank you. That was great. Um, you also mentioned that you are a voracious reader. Yep. So can you mention... And a, a slow reader, too. <laughs> and uh, they say that slow reading is actually real reading, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 so, so I was curious, uh, uh, name a few books, if you can, that you think are maybe underappreciated or a little bit under the radar or people might not have, you know, would learn things from reading about them. Well, um, you know, I mentioned the, the pretty new book out called Dear Chairman, um, and it's a, it's a, you know, actually it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lesson in behavior of human beings. Uh, it's, a, it's a lesson in, in, in thinking about uh, making judgments about whether or not business executives use their assets well in terms of compounding their capital. Um, I mentioned the book 100 to 1 in the Market that came out in 72. I've talked about that a lot, so people are reasonably familiar with it, but, but a few years ago they'd never heard of it. And, 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 and the big idea in that is the issue of compounding. Because even though he doesn't talk about that explicitly, he lists all kinds of characteristics that you'd find in businesses which might do this. Obviously, you know, low valuations, small value to begin with, all of those kinds of things. Um, and, and maybe I'll think of some others, but... Uh, sure. uh, Chris Mayer, I believe, has yeah. done sort of an updated work right. on... Uh, he did. ...in the recent yep. years on the same book. But I was curious, you have this workbench in your portfolio, yep. Uh, yep. the last 10% yep. of so many uh, small positions. 
and you mentioned this idea of you know 100 baggers. Right. So I was just curious, what are some 100 baggers that you see around that uh, you, know, well, you can share with us? I've, I've only had two in my life, uh -huh. and, I ha and I still own those two. Okay. And that's Berkshire Hathaway and American Tower. Right. And um, um, the fact of the matter is you only really need one. And uh, I mean, and that's a really important issue as it relates to investing, is you really only need to have one great success. Uh, and, and, and that is as it relates to whatever your goals might be. And, and so the quest is, for me, the search is, um, is, is trying to figure out what the characteristics of those are. So if, if you think about my comments and three-legged stool and high return businesses and so on, our view is that most of the time you can buy these exceptional businesses at reasonable valuations. Mm -hmm. So in today's market, you can buy American Tower, you can buy Moody's, or you can buy MasterCard at probably something like 19 times next year's free cash flow, 2018. And, and that means an earnings yield of 5 or 5.1%. If we're still in a 1.5% interest rate environment, that's an attractive deal. You know, that comparison. Um, if the business does, in fact, compound the free cash flow or book value or whatever is appropriate mm -hmm. for that company in the mid-teens and you pay in the upper teens for it, we like to say you'll get to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you'll do so without much risk. Periodically, the market gives us an opportunity to buy one of these great businesses at a discount. And then even more rarely, it'll give us the opportunity to buy one of these at a steal. So Berkshire Hathaway, I started buying back in the late 70s. And, and, and you know, in the late 70s, my initial purchases were at $105 a share. And that's the stock today, you know, is at $250,000 a share. And so that works. American Tower is, to me, a business that, that is situated like Microsoft was. Microsoft was at the intersection of the growth of the personal computer. They had the operating system. If you wanted a personal computer, it ended up basically going through that toll booth, the Microsoft. And so it was a fabulously profitable business. The growth of the wireless communication business, which as we know started with 1G and 2G and 3G and 4G, now they're talking about 5G. Each of those Gs requires a denser network of towers, more sophisticated antennas and so on, and the place they put those are, are on the antennas, by and large. So that the tower business is, is in that same, is a nearly identical kind of position that Microsoft was. And I'm not a technology guy, so I've, I'm already over my head. But um, that's a really important notion in terms of the, the exceptional nature of a business and the, ability, and the ability to grow it. And their marginal return at American Tower for an additional tenant above about 1.2, their, their marginal return is in the high 90% range. It's unbelievable. So once they put that asset in place and they get above break even, the marginal return is you know, in the 90% range, north of 90%. And what American Tower has done is they now are in 15 countries. And when we started with them in 1999, they were in the United States, Mexico, and Brazil. Now they're in a total of 15 countries, including the United States. In all of the things that were telephony related in the late 90s um, were the hottest things since the 4th of July firecrackers. And, and 2000 came, and all of those businesses fell off the cliff because they were levered well, American Towers leveraged 16 to 1. I mean, it was unbelievable. They're huge cash flow businesses and so on. And they had to delever that company, selling assets on a distressed basis in a declining market. And in the beginning of 2002, the stock was $5. It had gotten as high as in the 60s in 99. Beginning of 2002, it was $5. Uh, we bought a position at $5, and we were really proud of it. In September, it was $2. Uh, we got on the plane and went to see the CEO in Boston, uh, Steve Dodge, who was the founder. And the, what the market was focused on 
uh, was that in, they had about six billion of debt, but they had 200 million that was, came due in November of 2003, 15 months hence. And it was payable in cash or shares at the option of the company. They were desperately trying to raise cash. They couldn't use their bank lines to pay that off. They, you can't use the bank line to pay off somebody else's capital. And so the lower the price went, the more dilution an existing shareholder was going to have if they used shares instead of cash. And in October, the stock got to an interday low of 60 cents. We bought several million shares at about 80 cents. Uh, I still own mine. We have many of our clients still own theirs. Uh, that's the other example of a north of a hundred bagger. What was interesting was that the business itself was a terrific business masked by a bad balance sheet. And you had great people working hard to get it straightened out, to preserve their own investment, their own foundations and that sort of stuff. And, and it was just, so I think to myself, well, did I make a mistake by not really putting a lot of money to work? I was very timid. You know, if I say we bought a few million shares at 80 cents, that's not a lot of money. Um, and so if I'd been more confident, I would have put a lot of money in there and, you know, I'd be fighting with Warren Buffett for the, for the, for the place on that list. You know? uh, <laughs> but, but you get the idea. So, so the point is that periodically you get a chance to buy one of these great businesses at a bargain and even in a rare opportunity at just a, a steal. Um, so... Ms. Chuck, I have one final question for you. Uh, you know, there was a 2006 interview of yours that I was mentioning yeah. to you before we began the conversation. And, you, you know, Penn National Gaming, I think, was one of the stocks yeah. that uh, was a big part of the <coughs> portfolio at that time. And so was this company called Markel. Mm -hmm. So I remember the stock price from that interview because it was 444. Uh, and... Today it's roughly nine, nine, nine. yes, yeah, so slightly more than double, uh, and, but it's also been over eleven years. Yes. So the reason I'm asking is, does there come a point, even in the life of a good compounder, where you know the valuations are becoming optimistic enough, and the future rates of returns that you can see are low, where one should maybe rotate or move from one position to another? How do you think about selling? In other words. Um, well, one side of that, I think the most difficult thing to do in our business is to not sell if you're a long-term investor. And that is um, the, the ones that are really great are, have been hard for me to identify. It's taken me a long time to understand how good the ones are that are really good. And with, with uh, Almost everybody has less time in the market than I do. <laughs> but for those who have fewer years of experience, you know, if you get a disappointing quarter or you get something like that, temptation is often to sell. And, 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 and if you've got a really great one, that's probably a bad decision. It doesn't mean you can't lighten up a little bit and try to time it and buy some more. We don't do that very well, so we try not, we, we try not to fool around with it. In the case of Markel, like NSTAR, they'd had a record of 20 years of compounding book value per share in 2006 that was like 20% a year. Mm -hmm. And so like NSTAR, which was three times book when I bought it, Markel got to the point where it was two and a half times book or something like that. And the fact that, that, that I've only doubled my money in 10 years, a 7% return, uh, is, is, um, is, is a result of that by paying a valuation which in hindsight, was too high because the rate at which they could compound book was, was less than I had imagined it might be. Part of that backdrop is this whole issue of this 36-year secular decline in rates. All businesses have done less well over the last five or 10 years because of the decline in rates, and Markel is an example. And they're, they're, they've now, in my mind, fully adopted the Berkshire model of creating a business inside the holding company that is completely away from insurance. They call it Markel Ventures. Got a billion two in revenue, as you said, about 130 million in EBITDA. So it's roughly a 10 times EBITDA margin. Um, and that will give them the flexibility of being able to put capital work other than simply in a passive portfolio or other in an insurance business when, 
when rates aren't attractive to them, and they're one of the very small number of insurance companies that have the discipline of only putting money to work when the when their expected return is 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 positive combined ratio, positive combined ratio. So, so, so talking of names, I think we have about a minute left. Um, you you do mention you did mention Visa and Mastercard, and yeah. I think you own both. Uh, you also mentioned Moody's, uh, and it's a duopoly with yep. S&P. Right. I was wondering, you know, what are your thoughts on S&P as a business? Is it, you know, it, it has the same market shares even well, outside the U.S. You know, they have the similar structures. But uh, curious to hear. So, what you so think. in the last few weeks, uh, Moody's announced that they had they had come to an agreement with, I don't know, a government agency, the DOJ or somebody, in terms of paying a fine relating to their activity around the around the crisis. The amount of the fine was substantially lower than the Wall Street expected. And, 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 and S&P uh, paid a much larger fine more than a year ago because the SEC had the goods on them. They had a string of emails about people inside talking about how this stuff was crazy. And they didn't exist at Moody's. That is, if they existed, the government never found them. Uh, and and so there is a modest difference in, in when when the when the so this is a cultural difference cultural yes. difference and so when John Neff my partner joined the firm in November of 2009 one of the names that he suggested that we invest in was Moody's and I said oh we'll never buy that I mean I, their their behavior during the financial crisis was atrocious he was a very patient guy <laughs> and and he said well I really I think you should meet. This Ray, the CEO, and, and the other people, and so on. And over the next couple of years, I had the chance to go and meet the executives um, two or three times, and I made my own judgment about it. And so it wasn't until 2012 that we actually bought Moody's shares. But, it, but again, it was not much different price-wise than it had been in 2009 or 10. Um, and so that was an example. And what I've concluded then, still believe, was their behavior during that crisis was stupid, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't wrong, and it wasn't. Uh, um, it wasn't illegal, and it. You know, I mean, that sort of stuff. As as the emails showed, was the problem at S and P where people thought what they were doing was just foolish. There was no such evidence of that at Moody's, mm -hmm. and so I think there's a cultural difference of some. So we we haven't gone over there at S and P. We did it in Visa. Uh, because we have concentration limits in the mutual fund. Mm -hmm. uh, we did it with SBA uh, in the tower space because we have concentration limits, um, but we haven't done it with S&P and Moody's. So, okay, yeah. great. We are way out of time, but thank you, thank you so much, Chuck. Thank you this has much. been fantastic. Yeah. Thank you all for being great. a great audience. Thank you all. <laughs>